So uh, here we are. We are we're, we're jumping back into Acts as we continue our series. And uh, before I begin, I, I want to be faithful to my promise to you guys to, um, to, to, to never sugarcoat my own, my own journey with grief and the process that, that our family's walking through and the things that we're going through. Um, and as you know, we've talked about this a few times. It's a, it's a fine line of wanting to be transparent and share the reality of this journey without taking every opportunity that I get up here to be like, hey, let me, let me just uh, do some group therapy here by sharing some of what I'm going through, and this is hard. But uh, I, I want this to, I, I never want being up here to be reflective to anyone that we take hard things and we sugarcoat them and we say, get back on the stage and do the thing that you're good at doing and don't worry us with any of the other things that are going on. Not because of my own personal journey, but because I so deeply value your journey that this would never be a house or a community where you hide things, where you feel like you have to show up, put on a brave front and not be real with where you are and, and what you're doing. And so I, I wanna be perfectly honest with you. I didn't know if I I was going to make it to uh, to a point where I felt like I could teach this morning because Father's Day and the and the and the entire weekend and we did um, we did the Jeff Roden Memorial Baseball Tournament this last weekend over Father's Day just to honor my brother because he loved baseball and um, and so we did that tournament and that's where I was over Father's Day and I heard you guys had an incredible time together and I was uh, you know just standing by the dugout crying so. Um, the, the difficulty of that weekend, and I think the difficulty of, of grief and the difficulty of the journey is that it is, it's so layered and so nuanced and we just don't really know how it's gonna hit us. And it's not just that I'm sad, oh, I'm, I miss my brother. Um, you know, sometimes he was kind of, he, was, he wasn't the nicest guy to me, so maybe I don't miss him all the time because he would just tease me. Um, no, I do, I miss my brother, but then I also see the way that affects my parents. And I see the way that his kids are having to navigate how to do life without him and his wife is having to navigate how to do life without him and that and it just hurts so deeply and i think father's day um and we're coming up on the the one year anniversary of his death and it just it was it was a lot and evan um the hardest one of the hardest things about it was evan his son evan pre uh preached he didn't preach uh he pitched it's different um <laughs> They had him pitch. They had him pitch the game. They did a tournament, and, and Evans' turn to pitch came up on Father's Day, and and um, and that was emotional, you know. And I thought, oh, it's going to be such a cool like Disney story where he's going to surely he'll pitch a no hitter, right, or something incredible like that. And but what really what actually happened was was he he had a, a really difficult day, and he's an amazing, he's a phenomenal pitcher, and he just it was just a hard a hard day for him out on the mound, and. Um, and I had, and I just kept watching him coming back to the dugout and having to try to figure out how do I manage what's happening right now. And these were the moments where his dad would have been there for him in the dugout or, or right outside the dugout and just speaking over him and encouraging him and, and getting, picking him up. And it's just the absence is, is so profoundly felt in moments like that. And so it just, and then to top it off, I decided to go watch Top Gun. Uh, a couple days later, and I won't give away the movie, but thematically, I have never wept through a movie like I wept through Top Gun, and that's, that's saying something because it shouldn't really be a weepy movie, I don't think, I don't know. I don't know how you guys experienced it, but it just was, this journey this week has, has been one of the lowest and most difficult weeks of this whole process since probably about the three month mark of, of our loss. And, um, and in that, uh, there are moments where I want to be so connected with where I am and I never want to get up here, as I've told you guys before, I never want to get up here and just, oh, I can preach, so I'm going to preach. I always want to be real about this because um, we're hurting. You guys are going through hard things too. And when we show up and we have these moments where we feel like we're, we're sinking, that's the moment where the reality of our faith and where it is, is revealed. And so for me, when I begin to sink into these times, it's not like a quick fix all, but when I sink into these moments and these times, I want my heart and my response to be Jesus. I'm sinking under these waves. I'm sinking under. 
and he grabs me and he can pull me up so powerfully and as only he can. And I want that to be our reality of our experience. And, and in that story that I'm referencing in, in Matthew and it, where Jesus calls Peter out of the boat and says, walk to me on the water. I don't know, you guys remember this story, but Peter's in the boat and Jesus says, walk to me and there's wind and there's waves and there's storms around and Peter gets out of the boat and he walks to Jesus and then he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sleep, to sleep. He begins to sink under and he is, as he's sinking under the waves, he cries out to Jesus and Jesus pulls him up and then Jesus asks him this question. He says, he basically says, why is your faith small or or better interpreted or better translated, where is your faith? And I think that's such a, a an important question because it's not accusatory. It's not Jesus going, Peter, where is your faith? He's saying that when you walk out on the water in these difficult times and you begin to sink, it's re revealing where your faith is anchored. And so it's an appropriate question to say, as you're sinking under the waves and I'm lifting you up, are you seeing clearly where your hope and your faith is anchored? And I know for me, when I go through weeks like I'm in or that I've gone through the things, it's like, Jesus, I'm sinking under here. And he lifts me up and he goes, I'm not accusing you. I'm not judging your faith, but I want to ask you a question. Where was your faith anchored? Where is your faith set? And that's such a powerful and important part of how we continue to show up, how we continue to open our hearts, how we continue to heal, but also how we show up in community and how we lead is, is that question. Where's your faith? And, and you guys, I mean, think about this. Peter walked on water twice. First time to get out to Jesus. And the second time was back to the boat. And I would contend that there is a much more powerful revelation of the intimacy and the, and the tenderness of Jesus in the walk back to the boat than in the walk out to Jesus. I want to be around people who have, you know, like, I mean, you know, the gusto, like, I want the faith to walk on the water. I want the reality of having sunk under the waves. Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's just something in life that has hit me or happened and we know we are calling out to Jesus and he lifts us up. And then imagine if you'll allow me to take a little allowance with the scripture and insert a, some of the story that's not in there, but they had to get back to the boat somehow. I don't think Jesus chucked him. <laughs> but that walk back, there's always a way back with Jesus. And the walk back from failure, the walk back from sinking under, the walk back from that moment in your life when everything is broken or things aren't coming together and you know you're calling out to Jesus, I think that walk back is the place where restoration takes place. I want to be with people, not who have this gusto of faith to walk on the water to Jesus, but have the sustenance of his presence and his intimacy to say, and I know what it feels like to sink under the waves and to walk back to the boat with Jesus. There's always a walk back. And for some of you, you think that your life is defined by these big moments. And if you don't walk on the water, that Jesus is disappointed with you or the things aren't gonna happen. And I would tell you this, is that you are, you are in a far deeper place in your faith in your journey with Jesus when you know what it feels like to walk back to the boat with him, walking both ways sinking under and calling out to Jesus. And so to me, that's what this week was. A lot of for me was just Jesus. I feel like I'm getting swallowed up here. And he lifts me out of that and he pulls me up, but he doesn't just lift me out of the wind and the waves and not everything's gone and perfect, but he walks me back through the wind and waves as the storm continues, walking me back to that safe place that only he knows for me. And I believe that's what he wants to do for you. And, and, I, and you know, honestly, I think there's a prophetic word in there, or a word of encouragement, I should say, for, for some of us in this place. Is that your life is not defined by these glorious moments of faith where you walked on the water to Jesus. I want you to hear this. Is what you carry, what you release, what you have to give. I would love for it to be defined by what you learned from Jesus on the way back to the boat. And I feel that's what he's saying to so many of you is that he's walking you back into places of restoration. He's walking you back into places of gifts or callings or moments of life where you have felt like I failed in that place or it didn't happen the way I thought it would happen or whatever it is. And he's saying, I want to use you again, but I want to use you because you've learned from me on the walk back to the boat. 
And so we're on our way back to the boat. And if you're on your way back to the boat, I want you to hear this. Jesus has so much more to give you, being side by side with you, walking back in the wind and the waves, than you learned in your moment of bold faith to walk out to him in the first place. And so I just speak that over you as you're looking at places that he's walking you back. There's always a way back. If we're willing to call out to Jesus when we feel like we're going under and then experience his tenderness and his presence and his intimacy as he walks us back. Amen. Amen. All right. I think that wraps it up <laughs> for the day. Um, so I want to, I want to share with you a couple things. Um, that we have been developing here, and it ties in really to our series that we're doing on Acts, Communities of Transformation. And we've been in this series since 1978, and um, <laughs> we're up to Acts 16, maybe 17 if you squint. Um, we've, been at it, we've been at it for a little while. Um, and last, last time I taught, a couple weeks ago, I had this, and you can open your Bible to Acts 16, we'll probably read the second half again today, but uh, I had this plan uh, to teach Acts 16 and then to share with you two things that I wanted to just launch as vision to the church and share with you some things that we have coming up this year. And when I looked back at my notes, I realized I had about two and a half hours of content. Um, and so I, uh, we pushed this to today. So I want to bring you back to Acts 16 for just a few minutes, talk about it for a second, and then I want to share with you two things that Kate and I and our team are really, really excited about that we feel like God is leading us into. And so to remind you, this Communities of Transformation, this series on Acts, what is it about? What does it mean? What does it look like for us to be a community of transformation if we believe that God's Spirit was poured out on all flesh? on sons and daughters, on, on servants, on men, on women, that it was poured out on all flesh. What does it mean to take that empowerment and not simply gather with it and create really neat services where we experience the empowerment and the glory and the presence of God, but what does it look like to be people who take that empowerment, take that authority, take that um, unity with the Spirit of God and walk it out into the marketplaces of our life and bring, we are a community that has been transformed by the presence of Jesus, but what does it look like for you then to take, or for all of us, to take that transformation into our marketplaces and see transformation happening because of the empowerment of God's presence, because of the empowerment of God's Spirit, and that's what we've been talking about in the, as we've studied Acts. We've talked about what it means to be a Spirit-filled community, that it tears down the walls that divide people, that it, it takes that me and my, it disappears, and we begin to live in a supernatural generosity. And also to be a Spirit-filled community, we have this sense of awe of God's timing and His purposes in our lives around our cities right now. And because we carry a sense of awe and wonder at what God is doing, our eyes begin to open to the miracles and the opportunities and those divine appointments, as we call them, that are happening around us all the time. If we lose the sense of awe and wonder at what, what God is doing here and now, we will, we will put on blinders to the kingdom coming and his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll put blinders onto that and we'll just get caught up in busyness or functioning as opposed to awe and wonder. It says, God, you are at work miraculously and mightily in this time and in this day and I will have eyes that are open and watching for the things that you're doing. And that's what it looks like for us as we've studied Acts to be a spirit-filled community. But in Acts 16, we see that transition, continuing to transition throughout Acts. A spirit-filled community must also be a spirit-led community. And at the beginning of Acts 16, you have this moment where they're saying, we, should be, we need to head into a different region. And God shows up. God's spirit says, no, you're not to go into that region. And so instead of going, they wait on the Lord. And they, they, they allow the, the prophetic to function within their community and the prophetic voice comes and says this is not where we're to go right now and then they said okay well God we'll wait then before we go and as they waited Paul had a dream and the dream called him into the region that they were to go to and so they knew that they were led and because they knew that they were led they had an expectation that God was going to move in favor before them and make a way for the gospel to go out and that's what we see in Acts 16. To be a spirit-led community, it looks like we're directed by the prophetic direction of the Lord. 
It looks like the, the message is going to fall on soft hearts. You have Lydia and you have the jailer. And each of those situations is radically different, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But both of these moments, they found soft hearts of people where the gospel, the seeds of the gospel were able to fall and take root. Because why? Because they were being led by the Spirit of God into places where the hearts were ready to receive the truth of who Jesus was and what he was doing. Their message was backed by authority. Their message was backed by power. And they had the confidence that they were where they were supposed to be and they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And so they saw the supernatural empowerment back them up to the point where they cast out a, a prophesying spirit out of a, out of a girl who was following them around. And, and, and Paul got annoyed, eventually annoyed with this girl that was following them around constantly saying like, they're telling you about Jesus and how to get saved. And they're like, I don't know why Paul got annoyed with that because it sounds like it's it's a pretty good, you know, announcement of what they're doing. But as we talked about a couple weeks ago, he wasn't working for the billboards. He was working for that granular level of relationship. And I, and I know I joke, but he turns around and he goes, hey, get out of this girl. And, they, and this, this spirit left her. And so they had that authority and that assignment that they knew they were walking in. And they found that victory wasn't about ease. You know, their victory in one sense came through relationship, but in another sense, it came through being persecuted and beaten and thrown into prison. And, and they saw victory through that. And so being led by the spirit doesn't mean that everything we do is easy and every door flies open before us. It means that there's gonna be sometimes and a lot of times difficulty, but it's how we remain and go, wait, God, even when this is hard. So, here we go. So if, if you equate obedience to the Spirit of God to ease, you're going to often be hit up against something and you're going to bail out of it over and over. And that will become a cycle in our life of saying, if I'm hearing God correctly, everything should be easy in front of me. That's not what Paul and Silas and Luke, that's not what they experienced at all. There were some moments where, where it did feel, you can see, it felt like the doors threw open before them. But there were also moments when they were getting beat by canes and thrown into stocks in the jail. And if they had, if they had this this belief that said, oh, if, if we're following God, everything's going to be easy. They would bail out of that moment and they would be looking for the first opportunity to flee as opposed to, no, we believe that God called us here. And so we're going to remain in that heart and with that sense of God is doing something even when it doesn't look like he's at work. And so instead of, instead of creating a list to get revenge, they just chose to worship and they worshiped. And, and, and so as they worshiped, they saw this. When we are being spirit-led, hardships and setbacks become places of miraculous intervention and divine encounters. And we know the story. The earthquake happens. Their chains are broken open. They go. They were able to leave if they wanted to, but they didn't leave. And the jailer came in. He was going to kill himself. They said, don't, don't kill yourself. We're still here. And I know we celebrate Paul and Silas. And we're like, it's so amazing that they didn't run away. Honestly, can I tell you something? It's going to kind of burst your bubble. I think they didn't run away because they had been brutally beaten. It's not like they're like, oh yeah, let's run away. Sometimes life beats us so deeply and profoundly that even when God does a miraculous work, all we can do is lay there and say, we're still not delivered yet. And he's going to show up in the midst of that. And he's going to take enemies and turn them into allies. And that's what happened. The jailer became the one who was holding them in prison, became the one who cleansed their, who took them and wrapped up their wounds and took care of them. And I know we could say, oh, it's amazing that they didn't run away. And okay, I'll get behind that maybe. But really, if you got beaten with canes and you got thrown into, into these stocks all night long and you're just laying there, look. They're not going like, let's worship, because I think if we worship, there will be an earthquake, and an earthquake will knock these chains off of us, and we'll be able to get away. This was their, this was their deep response to where they found themselves. They weren't doing it to get out. They were doing it because it was true to who they were and what they believed God was doing. And if, you're, if this is where you have us, God, then we will worship in the midst of this. And we see it from our side and we're like, well, you know what you need to do in your hard times? You need to worship. Why? Because then God's going to do a miracle and he's going to get you out of that. No. You know what? When you're in that hard time, you need to learn to find the essence of what they found is that you can worship even if it doesn't change the outcome and there isn't an earthquake and chains falling off of you and all of the other stuff going on. Can you worship him because you know you're where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing and that heaven is behind you even when it doesn't look simple and straightforward and even when you encounter that pushback 
Oh, God, let us be people who respond in worship, not to get out of anything, but to bring you into everything. So there we go. Acts 16 brings us to that place. And it's powerful that they stayed in that, in that place and they were able to see the gospel take root because they weren't after some kind, winning some kind of point or anything like that in Philippi. They were after transformation that they knew that Jesus would bring if there would be a small community within that city that was encountering and living for Jesus. And that's what I want us to have as spirit-filled, spirit-led people, a community of transformation, that we are not looking out at our cities, our marketplaces, and the people around us as enemies, that when we look out there, and I say this all the time, but when we look out, that we do not see battlefields that we have to defend ourselves in and take our weapons and fight against people, but we truly see mission fields. If there's something that would radically change your life, it is that you have grown up in this distinct culture with Christianity mixed in it, and you believe that this is your right to be in this place and to be unopposed in your beliefs and we forget to see this culture in America around us as far post-Christian which means this is a mission field it is not a battlefield and when we see people and their views to be opposed and to fight and to push down as opposed to saying okay God what is it that you want me to do if you walk out of this room as an ambassador and a missionary Instead of as a citizen that that is deserved certain rights or should have it a certain way. Is this too political for you guys? I'm not trying to be political. I'm not at all. I'm not. I'm just simply saying we have to have the viewpoint of ambassadors and missionaries to do the things that God is wanting us to do in this time, in this place, in this nation, in this state, in this city. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what I'm saying. You, you guys know, like, that's about as close as I'll get. Okay. Right? Here we go. So the two things that I want to share with you that we have coming up that I think are an extension of this heart of being, what does it mean to be a community of transformation? When we're a community of transformation, when we look at Acts and we see that there is a place where favor rests on us and they're led by a word from the Lord. Uh, how many of you know... The st- how, uh, how do I do this? How many of you know the story of how we came to be in this building? Raise your hands. Okay. So I want to tell a quick story of, a, of a, a testimony of how we came to be in this place. Because it is, it is about being led by a word of the Lord and seeing his favor showing up and opening doors, even when it was incredibly difficult and not everything has been super straightforward. So Kate and I came to Living Waters. We joined the team uh, in like 2000. And we've been here ever since. This is it. And so we walked that journey of being on the team with Garrison Jan. And, and after several years of doing that, I think it was, I'm going to mess up my dates, but say 2013, something like that. Garrison Jan came to Kate and I and said, uh, you guys have been on our team for 13 years. You have been faithful. Um, and we, we would love to transition the leadership of the Church of Living Waters to you and Kate. And so we said, we prayed about that for a long time. Um, and as we prayed about that, we asked the Lord for a word and for a directive. And so at the time that we, from 2000 on, for a lot of those years, we lived on Holly Street downtown. And so we would drive up to the old church building up on Roberts Road by North Medford High School. It had about 6,000 square feet total. Uh, all the youth room, the kids rooms, the adult area, it was, it was, that, was, that was total. And, um, and we would drive up there. We would drive back and forth to work every day. And we didn't know that we would become the senior leaders of this church or anything like that. But we would drive back and forth to work and we would pray. And we would pray this, God, would you give us a, uh, would you give us a church in the city? And what we were dreaming into then was was that we thought that Garrison Jan would probably send us out of Living Waters to plant a church down here in the city and that we would be able to work in partnership with them because we believe that they, have, they still do and that they did have so much to give and, and, and pour out for the kingdom. And so that's what we envisioned. So we would pray every day, God, would you open up this city that we would have a church in the city? We know that you have much that you want to do to get to reach a city. You have to reach the heart of the city to reach the heart of the city. You got to be in the heart of the city and you have to show up. And we, that's what we were prophesying. And that's the word that the Lord gave us. And so when they asked us to become the pastors of the church or the leaders of the church, the, one of the first questions we asked them was, could we move from this building downtown? If God figures out a way to do it, would you be okay if we moved out of where we've been to where we feel like God is calling us to go? And they said, sure, you can do that. And so 
Fast forward, as we stepped into leadership, that property up there with 6,000 square feet, we, we uh, had a few empty acres. And so we, uh, we, 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 we said, well, what, if, what if we sold the acreage that was up there and we looked around for a building that was downtown that we could fit into. And so we began to search and we began to pray and we began to go, okay. And, I, and we looked at every building that we could think of in the city. Like I toured building after building. My favorite building is still the brick building on, on 10th Street. And I like that we, we walked through there so many times. Say, Jesus, because that was the one we would walk. We would drive by it every time. And so um, we were believing for that. So you know how we get Pentecostals, right? I believe I'm claiming that one. I want, I want that one. I had like 17 buildings claimed. Uh, I don't know how that works. Uh, but it, it doesn't. Um, and so I, I, we, we looked at so many buildings and, and we had some, some opportunity maybe to sell like the empty property that was up there at Living Waters and, and we had an offer on it and it was like X amount of dollars. Can that, can that money allow us to get a campus downtown? Maybe we could have two campuses. Like, is there enough? It's not enough. There's no way it's enough. And so we, we went through the whole process and uh, one day after church, uh, a gentleman who had been attending the church for a little while, he came up to me and he said, I, I remember the, a few weeks back you guys presented this dream that you have to move the church downtown. Um, how's that going? And I was like, it's not going. There's nothing, there's nothing downtown. Uh, we've looked at every building. They're too expensive to fit people, to be able to do all this stuff. And he said, he said, have you looked at the Lithia building? And I'm like, this building literally, I swear, like God cloaked it. Like Star Trek, like and cloaked it. I didn't see it. I, I've been here since I was since 1976, right? Like I was like the Lithia Building. Remind me the Lithia Building. He's like the one that sits right downtown. I was like, I, I don't. Yeah, let's go look at it. So that day after church, he said, "My friend owns the building. I got keys in my pocket. Let's go look at it after church today." So we walked into this building the first time, and God was like, "This is the one." Hey, you've been claiming all the wrong buildings. This is the one. But God stores up the prayers of the right, and He just said, "No, this is not how it's going to look. You think it's this way, but it's going to be this way." And so we walked in here, and we were like, "Oh my gosh!" And He said, "Do you want to? Do you want to buy it?" And I was like, um, well, uh, <laughs> we went from selling part of our land uh, to having to sell all of it and move the church down into the city, which typically they wouldn't recommend you do in the first like 18 months of leading a church. Um, <laughs> uh, or taking on a church in Ashland, which we still love and loved. And so anyway, um, <clears throat> Do you want to buy it? And I said, I don't, I don't think we can. I don't think we can afford it. I don't know how that would work to move a church, blah, 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 blah. The guy who was interested in buying the property called me back that week and he said, hey, we, you know, we'd be kind of interested in buying the, just the, the empty land, but what if we bought the whole thing? And I was like, oh, okay. So how much would you sell or would you buy the whole thing for? And, uh, and they said, well, about 1.75 million. Okay, that's awesome. So we said, let's see how much the Lithia building is for. So we called the, we had the conversation with the Lithia building. And uh, so this building was available, all of this 40, almost 40,000 square feet. We're going from 6,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet in the heart of the city. Why? We had a word. We were directed by the Lord. We're believing that he's going to open doors. Uh, and they said, we'll sell you this building for 1.25 million. So we said, yes, um, we can move our church from 6,000 square feet to 38,000 square feet in the heart of the city in the way that we feel like God is calling us to do and the things he's asking us to do start here in the heart of the city and we can put $400,000 or whatever it was in our, in our pockets um, to be able to buy those Porsches that we really wanted. And um, <laughs> hallelujah, give to double offering morning. Uh, and so we were able to use that money to get the building to the point where it is now and, uh, and to do all of the architectural drawings, to do all of the planning, to get all of the things done. We put about $100,000 of that, or maybe more than that, probably $150,000 into just getting it to where it is now. And so as COVID approached, so that's where we sat. As, as COVID approached, we were getting ready to step into phase two of the renovation, which involves, for some of you, if you haven't walked over there, there's three huge bays on that side of the building that we would love to develop and use. We want them to be useful, not for Sunday gatherings only. We want them to be useful for the city. We want to be useful for people. We want this to be a place that's functioning every day of the week, if possible, and not just like, oh, look at our cool sanctuary we built for two hours on Sunday morning. It cost us $6 million. Rad. 
But what if we thought about a building that was for the city after the heart of the city and it reflected the heart of this place in everything that we do. And so we've been gifted as God has le led us. I, did, I almost said God has left us. He is not as God has led us to this place. Um, we are answering that call. And so what you're going to see in, as we have come out of this last season and we, again, are feeling that fresh vision and that awakening to, to pick up again and to do the renovations that we believe God has for this building, you're going to see probably the first thing you're going to notice is the outside of the building being painted this summer. Um, we believe that that's something that God's put on our heart to do. That will allow us to say, hey, we're here. Like, we're here. And it'll awaken people um, to, to what's happening. And then we will work on getting that larger room Room over there opened up for us to be on Sunday mornings, but also for events and for outreaches. We still have the warehouse on that end that you guys know as part of this miracle. I was like, God, why is it taking so long to renovate this building? My mindset. Why is it taking so long? We've got money. People are ready to give. People are ready to work. But it never felt like we quite pulled the trigger on getting it really going, what was going on, and then the fires happened. You guys know the miracle of having this building to be able to take hundreds and th thousands of dollars of relief uh, efforts and work and goods and bring them through this house right out into the city, right out into people that needed it because we had this space. If I'd had my way, that would have all been built out into who knows what, like bathrooms and kitchens and meeting area. It wouldn't have been a place where FEMA could back up a truck and say, here's 72 pallets of water for you guys to give out or here's the tents that people need or whatever. So it's just such a rad miracle of how God has done that. And so you're going to see us continuing to renovate and move this project forward because it's time and we believe Believe, and our, our leadership council and our team uh, believe that it's time to, to pick that back up after an extremely difficult couple years where we said, let's just hold for, for a little bit. And as we held, God had an incredible use for the, for the city, but now we feel his, his heart leading us forward again. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect. And so that's what we wanted you to know. We didn't want to start doing renovation and work. And, and you're like, what's going on? We want you to be a part of that story and a part of that journey. Um, there will be opportunities as always to serve, to, to help, to give, like we're, we'll, we'll let you know about all of that. And the second thing that I want you to know about is our heart to be a, a community that carries transformation is that we're going to do something, I think, a little bit wild, a little wacky, but I think it's going to be cool. Um, and, and if it fails, it fails, whatever. Um, so, yeah, could we be a little bit less afraid of failing while we're following Jesus? It would be really, really healthy. Um, so last year, and I mean... I don't want to block it entirely out of my mind, but before COVID and all of that happened, we were doing church outs. And if you remember what church outs were, is that a lot of times weekends landed on holidays and our heart was like, we won't have, we won't have church Sunday church that weekend. It's a church out. It's a, it's a weekend to be with your community groups. It's a weekend to be with your families. It's a weekend to be Jesus and carry Jesus into the places that you find yourself. Let's not be so intent on gathering that we forget the power of going well. And so those Sundays off were about going into our spheres of influence, into our marketplaces, into our families, or maybe you need to go into the woods and meet with Jesus. And you would sometimes be slave to a religious rhythm that says, I've got to be at church on Sunday morning instead of going and saying, wait, I need to be with, I need to be with him. And so, uh, I mean, not that we're, anyway. Um, so we did that for a while and I, I love the idea. I love the heart behind it. But sometimes when you're just laying those on uh, holiday weekends, it was like church off instead of church out. Um, and so we, we, <laughs> uh, we didn't want that to be the case. Uh, so for the second half of this year, Here's what we're going to do. The last Sunday of every month, we are, they're going to be our community life Sundays. And we are not going to, uh, we're not going to have church the way that maybe you imagine church. Those will be our Sundays to go out into the community. Um, actually, wait, let me, let me pull that back. Those are going to be our Sundays where we highlight and value our community groups getting together and being together. We want to emphasize opportunities for people to join in community groups and be a part of them. And a lot of times people say, I can't lead a community group because I got too much stuff going on or I can't be a part of a community group because I have too much going on. Sometimes the too much going on is us setting a religious schedule for you and saying, show up to this thing, show up to this thing, show up to this thing, as opposed to be free to do the things that you want to do. So if you could meet with your community group 
group on a Sunday morning, if you could uh, lead or open your home on a Sunday morning, if we had 10 to 20 groups around the valley of 10 to 20 people meeting on a Sunday morning and that was our Sunday gathering, that would be incredible. But don't think of it as just another meeting because what we're going to do on those Sunday mornings is we are going to be people who serve. We want to get out of this house, this particular place, and we want to get into the neighborhoods around us. So specifically, Liberty Park is a place that God has highlighted to us over and over and over. And so sometimes either people who aren't in community groups or community groups are going to come down here on Sunday morning. We're going to meet together. We're going to rally. We're going to get out our shovels, our gloves, our whatever it is, whatever we feel like we're supposed to do that day. And we're going to go into this neighborhood or into the places or down into the city. And we're just going to serve our city. We're going to ask the Lord, what do we do? How do we do it? And he's going to, he's going to give us resources, authority, opportunity to do those things. And so some of your Sunday mornings might be bringing with, think about it with your kids and family and people, how do we break down this lack of community that we're experiencing in culture? I believe it's not going to be about, oh, we got to come into agreement. I believe that when we start serving together, we take our eyes off of each other and off of our disagreement and we put it on something that we can do together side by side. We begin to build connection that's healthy and it starts to bridge some of that cracking that's happening within our culture, within our society, and even honestly within the Living Waters community that breaks my heart. It's not what I want to see. And so I know that it's on us to go and to do this. And so the other thing that we're gonna do on, on these Sunday mornings is, and I'm gonna share this last because I don't want everyone to be like, oh, that's what I wanna do. But I believe there's gonna be some community groups that meet in here at 10 o'clock, since we aren't gonna have a, a regular gathering, that we're gonna meet here at the church and there's gonna be a big table set up and people are gonna just be able to come in and be welcomed in. And maybe they're like, is this church? Yeah, this is church. Come in, eat with us, hang out with us. Maybe somebody will play some, some music and maybe there'll be a little teaching or just an encouragement, but really it's about connecting with people People and connecting hearts with people. So I don't want there to ever be this thing where someone shows up on a Sunday morning and the front doors are locked and we're like, oh, too bad. So there will be this place where as people come that there is uh, an invitation of like, this is what we're doing today. We break bread together. Jesus said that whenever we break bread, we're to do it in remembrance of him. And so we're teaching people what that looks like to have a place at the table, to have communion together in the sense of being together and building relationship. And one of the things that I often lament about being a part of this community in any community that does church Sunday rhythms is that we spend a lot of time with your focus and your attention on Jesus, of course, but really it's a lot of time focused on the person who's up front or the worship leader, the worship team, or the speaker. But my heart longs for is for you to be connected to the people around you more than you connect to me. That you would be connected as a community more than you connect to Nisha and the worship team. We love those connections. But what if you attend this church for five years and all the connection you feel is to the person who's up front with the microphone, but you're not growing connection with the people around you. And so we want to figure out ways to increase that and to invite people into that. And we believe that's having a robust vision of community groups. But listen, if you've ever been a part of church and you hear me say community groups, I, you're probably triggered and you're like, what do I got to do? I got to go find 12 people and make a new one and then 12 more people and make a new one. And like, what does it come with? Do I have to sign up and do it for the rest of my life? Are we going to be doing like my memory verses or what are we doing? I don't know, but it's not that. It's just about saying my house is open. Jesus is at the center and I want people to be with me in that journey. That's what we believe that community looks like and that our community life groups are going to look like. Um, and so we want to invite you into that. That's going to begin. Our first one is going to be July 31st. We're going to do it through the rest of the year and we're going to try it out. You're going to hear probably as we get closer, you're going to hear, okay, there's going to be a group of people who are going to go into Liberty Park and just canvas the area and maybe serve some people in their homes and, and see what's needed there. If that's something you want to be a part of, then you go, yeah, I want to be on that group. If you are saying, I would love for to be a part of a, a community group that's meeting on Sunday morning somewhere, we'll get you that information and we, we'll figure out how to do that. Um, if you have a heart to be one that helps us set a table and welcome people in and do something radically different on a Sunday morning than what people are expecting and, and just loving on people, then, then hit, hit us up to be a part of that. But it's going to be a, a different type of Sunday. It's not a Sunday off. It's a Sunday, truly, it's a Sunday for us to go. It's a Sunday for us to be out of this normal routine and out of that normal rhythm. This building is a, is, a, is a gift to us, and it's incredible that we are here. But let's use it not to say, oh, look at us in our big shiny building in our cool meeting room where we can fit 800 people. I don't care about that. 
I care about how we mobilize, how we are filled with his spirit and led by his spirit into the marketplaces around us. And by doing this, where we take this Sunday rhythm and go, what if we didn't feel this burden to meet together in this way every single Sunday, but we started encouraging each other. As scripture says, that we would stir one another up to creativity and good works. And I believe that's what we're gonna be doing on these Sundays for the rest of the year. So those are the two things that I wanted you to hear this morning as we talk about what it looks like to be a community of transformation. This building is going to be being worked on, but it's not just to give us a place where we can cloister ourselves away from culture and away from the city. This is to be a launching pad, and this is to be a place of redemption. This is to be a house of prayer. It is to be a house of worship, but it is also to be a home to people who need to know the Father and his redemptive work, that every one is a son or a daughter waiting to be called home and let's call them let's call people home into community not into a 10 o'clock gathering yes. right and that is on us to build that community that's on us to tear down our walls that's on us to be led by the spirit and to see people and connect with people and build hearts with people and to serve with people are you guys with me Awesome. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. We love you guys. Um, July 31st, that will begin. You'll hear a bunch more about it, but we wanted to make sure it was in your head, in your heart early on. So have a great Sunday, you guys. Uh, I would recommend maybe not being outside too much, but if you do, uh, wear sunscreen for me. It makes me feel better. Love you guys.